Hi everyone, welcome to the 2020-2021 school year and AP US history. It had been my intention to start kind of um, making these recordings and putting in them out there uh, so that you could get started over the summer. But if you like me, uh, you're gonna be, you've been very busy. I know I have, we took on a project and uh, it's taken me a lot of time. So I haven't been able to do this until now. So here I am in my basement on a sunny summer day uh, and we're gonna go over pre-Columbian societies. So um, this is something that I'll be explaining to you in class and all of you who are taking AP US history have opted not to do the remote learning. You've opted to go to school. So for that, I thank you. Uh, it makes things a lot easier. We'll all be there and we can kind of go at the same pace. Um, so that'll be good. Having said that, things could change. You never know what's gonna happen. Um, so we'll just try to roll with it as we go. So chapter one um, covers one of nine periods that are covered in AP US history. On Google Classroom, I sent you a link uh, to College Board where they explain all these different periods when the test is going to be. I'm also putting a form on Google Classroom and I'm gonna sign it where you go through and you look at the key concepts each of these periods, each of these nine periods um, have key concepts, so things you have to know about those periods. And so there's a worksheet. So I expect you to go through the, the presentation, read the material, do that worksheet, and then we're gonna talk about it all in class. I also have a video quiz that I'm gonna have you do as well. It's my hope that you do the reading and you watch this, this um, lecture uh, before you do um, the, the video quizzes, right? Uh, because they'll just give you some more information and all build and build and build, We're kind of scaffolding our, our learning that way. Um, so anyway, these are very long um, recordings. The reason for that is because I include a lot of information. If I was just gonna gloss over the key concepts, um, then I feel like you won't get the bigger picture. Uh, we'll be addressing AP US history with the key concepts, but this is still dual credit. So I wanna make sure that you have a very good foundation of knowledge um, that we're gonna build upon for American history and for that matter, world history to some extent with what we're talking about today. All right, so this is New World Beginnings. And in this section, I've broken it down into two parts just because of the length. In this section, we're gonna look at pre-Columbian societies. That is societies that existed here in the Americas before Christopher Columbus came and kind of just opened up that whole can of worms and all these people from Europe and other parts of the world start to come to the Americas and we get the Columbian Exchange. So let's go ahead and look at these pre-Columbian societies. Um, most of the developed societies were not located here in what is now the United States. So we're gonna spend a lot of our time looking at the Aztec, the Inca and the Maya. Um, in the next section, we'll look at the causes for European colonization, um, then their their exploration, well, their exploration and colonization, um, and then the effect that that had um, on the indigenous populations, and then this clash of cultures that come together here in the Americas. So let's get started. Okay, so if you look at the United States, it's important to understand a bit of our geology and geography so that you get an understanding of where people lived and how they adapt to their environment um, and, and just how America is is geographically. Uh, most of you know, I've had some students in the past um, don't believe that it looks mountainous or that sort of thing, but it is. So we have two main mountain chains, the Appalachians and the Rocky Mountains. I've hiked mostly the Appalachians. Uh, the Rockies are much higher. That's because they are much newer. They haven't been worn away um, through time. Right. We also had the Great Ice Age, right, two million years ago, um, and then um, even you know last Ice Age, what about ten thousand years ago? And what that did is that flattened uh, a lot of, well, it ended about ten thousand years ago, uh, a lot of the land, especially where we are, and left behind a lot of different lakes. Um, Great Salt Lake, that remain, that's the in, remains of an inland sea when plates pushed up. Um, the Rocky Mountains and then kind of created more land there. Um, so it's interesting to see how uh, it took shape. 
This right here, this is a diagram showing how the continents kind of pulled apart through the continental drift theory, plate tectonics, so Pangaea, and then it split apart. You can kind of see how um, the Americas were once attached to Africa and Europe and then split that way. When they split, um, also plants and animals were separated, and then uh, people who came out of uh, East Africa, it is believed, then started to migrate to different places, eventually ending up here in the Americas. Okay, so how did they get here, right? So it's believed that it was anywhere from like 45 uh, to 23,000 years ago. You're going to see a video um, and they have a different take on it. On here it says 35,000 years ago. On this one video um, that you're going to have to watch, it says 23,000 years ago. Um, so they, they you know, people don't know it's difficult um, and some people make arguments for one thing and some for another. So and they crossed over what's known as this land bridge, but really what it was is either ice because people came during the last ice age or because so much of the earth's water or oceans were um, held up by ice that caused the sea levels to drop and then people could walk over so they kind of came over and slowly populated the land and they trickled down first from north america and then all the way down to the tips of south america when Ferdinand Magellan circumnavigated the globe, or his expedition there did, he died in the Philippines, um, they went through uh, the southern tip of South America, and they called it Tierra del Fuego, the land of fires, because on both sides uh, there were these big fires from the people, the indigenous populations who lived there, right? So anyway, the sea levels rose about 10,000 years ago, and then people quit populating uh, the area. Well, at least for a while. Some people believe, as you see, that perhaps they did populate from other locations than from uh, East Asia. So many people estimate that there were about 54 million, how they came up with that number, I don't know, people living in the Americas at the time that Christopher Columbus came. Of course, those numbers were going to be um, reduced drastically, drastically because the native population um, was devastated by the diseases that were brought over by the Europeans uh, that they had no immunities built up to. Uh, there were complex civilizations, as I said, but none of them were really located here in what is now the United States. Okay, so this is the Bering Land Bridge coming over from Siberia. Siberia is East Asia, um, so that's parts of what is now Russia. Right, so they came over um, and then crossed over the Bering Sea to Alaska and then kind of came on down and then populated other locations. As you're going to hear on a video, the video quiz, it's believed that there's another group that it continued south. Right, so this is very interesting. I'm very excited when I, I get new information like this. This guy right here, Dusty Crawford, he and his family, they are members of the Blackfoot tribe uh, in Montana. And um, they've, many of them serve very proudly in our military. Um, but anyway, uh, his brother was very interested in, um, in genetics and family lineage and geology and those sort or I'm sorry, uh, family genetics and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, he had a DNA test. Unfortunately, before the results came back, his brother passed away. And his brother would have been very excited to know um, their heritage, right? He has the oldest known, um, I can't say DNA, um, but his DNA dates back 17,000 years. So um, the, the traces are the oldest of any American ever found uh, here uh, on this continent. And what they found is that it goes back to Polynesia. Now, Polynesia are islands where like the Fiji and, um, you know, near, near Australia down off the coast of Australia and New Zealand, that sort of thing. So it's believed that many of these people came by way of boat, right, up to Hawaii and that sort of thing. Um, it's believed that they first went to South America and then came up this way, right? So this is all very exciting and it shows that his ancestors didn't come across the Bering Land Bridge, but came across the Pacific Ocean. Um, so it's really neat how we're getting all sorts of data about that. All right. Of the vast civilizations, as I said, there weren't, there was one maybe um, here in the United States that existed prior to Columbus, and it was in Illinois, believe it, believe it or not. Um, but anyway, you had the Maya, the Aztec, and the Inca. 
the Maya were located up there where the green is. Now they had actually died out uh, before Columbus came over. There were also the Aztec. The Aztec in the red up there, they were conquered by the Spanish uh, conquistador Hernan Cortez. And then there were the Inca. The Inca are fascinating. They were located down along the Andes Mountains in South America. They were the largest civilization that existed here. Uh, very structured and orderly civilization, very warlike um, people, much like the Aztecs. Um, and they were conquered also by the Spanish conquistador who had been part of Hernan Cortez's entourage. His name was Francisco Pizarro. So we're going to look at these three. Okay, so the Maya, as I said, they died out. They were around um, from 250 to 900. Um, so they died out about the same time, give or take about 100 years, um, that the Vikings came over to America. So it's believed that the reason they died out, they were located on the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, it's believed that they ran out, they had a period of drought, so there wasn't enough fresh water, and so uh, their civilization just kind of dwindled. People continued to live in the area, but it wasn't this vast kingdom that they once had had. So when the Spanish came over, um, they believed them to be heathens, right, because they didn't practice. Christianity, so they were barbarians. And so what they did is they destroyed um, much of their written tablets. So they had a writing system, but we don't know what it is because so much of it has been lost um, to history. Um, they also had a really advanced math system and a calendar, one of the best calendars that they, they could keep, right? Because we have 365 and a half days a year. And so our calendar, we have to make up for it every fourth year with leap year. But theirs was very, very detailed. So much so that they had it mapped out until 2012. And that's why everybody thought the world was going to end in 2012 because that's when the Mayan calendar ended. Uh, they even did a movie about it back in 2012. And of course, the world didn't end. Sometimes it feels like it's about to with everything that's going on crazy uh, in the world right now. Uh, they also had, um, you know, an astronomical system. Uh, they knew about all the celestial bodies. They observed them. They had observatories. And that's how they kept their calendar so accurate. They also had some um, interesting religious rituals which involved human sacrifices, as did the Aztecs. I'm not too sure. I don't think that the Inca did. They had vast cities, um, most of them located in what is today Mexico on the Yucatan Peninsula, but also in Belize um, and Guatemala, places down there. Like all civilizations, civilizations here in the Americas, none of them had developed the wheel except for um, like a child's toy, um, I understand. Um, and many historians believe that the reason for that is because they didn't, they lacked the animals um, that would aid in like developing a will because uh, in Europe and Asia and Africa, uh, they had pack animals. They had oxen and horses and that sort of thing. And so they hook a cart up to them and then they could pull um, pull those, the, the carts, right? So they hadn't developed it here. Um, there were no oxen. There were no cows. Uh, there were bison, but um, they wouldn't up to a cart, right? Um, there were some horses here about 5,000 years ago. It was a very small uh, breed of horse and they became extinct uh, about 5,000 years ago. Uh, horses and cows and all of these animals came uh, with the Europeans. Okay, so this is the Yucatan Peninsula. You can see the area outlined there in red. Um, if you were to go to um, Cancun, you would be on the very tip top of the Yucatan Peninsula there. For the most part, uh, the Yucatan is very flat, except for in the southern region down there, and it's tropical rainforest. It's also got a lot of limestone, and oftentimes what happens is the water breaks up the limestone and you get these deep holes or crevices. Um, they call that, um, they're cenotes. We just call them sinkholes, right? So I have been to three of these locations. Up on the top, you can see it, Chichen Itza, Coba, and Tulum. Um, I would love to go to others, um, but and I have some pictures in here that you'll see um, that, that we got to visit there. Uh, I've been to Mexico probably seven times. I love going there. Okay, here is a writing system. Um, you notice that they had the number zero, which was very advanced, and it makes a lot of sense. One, one dot, two, two dots, and then when you get to five, it shifts to where you have a line, then a line and a dot is six, and then two lines is ten. So it just kind of goes on like that, and um, 
think it, it makes perfect sense. To me, in some ways, it's a lot like um, it's a lot like the Roman numerals in a in a weird sense. Okay, so here is a picture of a pyramid at Chichen Itza, which I think it has an interesting story. So when I was there, um, we had a tour guide taking us around and telling us all about the location, um, which was very interesting. Uh, but on this side of the pyramid, if you note the stairs that are going up, and the stairs, by the way, are very steep and very shallow. So very tiny steps that you would have to take to get there. And I have, uh, for a woman, I have big feet. Um, so I'm, they, they don't allow people to do that uh, right now. Anyway, uh, go up there. Uh, it was used for religious purposes. Probably they did human sacrifices up there. I know that the Aztecs did uh, on their pyramids. But anyway, uh, if you wonder why are these stones away? Well, it appears that um, this back in maybe like the 1920s, there was an American who came down. He wanted to build a hotel, but he needed um, some stones. So he just starts taking them away from this pyramid. Um, sad but true. Um, what happened? All right. So this is also a ball field right here. Uh, this location, it's not also, but this part of Chichen Itza, it's not far from the pyramid. You can kind of walk maybe a hundred football field length away. Um, so in the background where these people are, and I, I put this on here, um, this is a ball field. It's very similar to soccer. Um, but what they would do is you'd have to get this ball that was made out of I don't know, the bladder of an animal or something through this hole right back there without using your hands. And then you'd have to go up the ramps right there. So it's, very, it's much more challenging than trying to get it through a goal, right? You have to get it into that specific hole. The winner, or not the winner, again, I've heard various uh, accounts of this. After the game, then, there would be a human sacrifice to the gods. Now, the tour guide told us that the person's sacrifice would be like the leader of the winning team because you don't want to give uh, the gods a loser, right? Um, so I, I've heard other places, though, that they would do a loser. So I don't know. Uh, but anyway, you do a human sacrifice. And that human sacrifice was done um, on this thing um, right here. You lay the person on that and then um, cut out his beating heart. Okay, this is an observatory um, right there. Um, this is what they would use to observe the celestial bodies, you know, the sun, the planets, um, the stars, and everything else, not the sun. Um, probably you don't want to sit there and stare at the sun. Uh, but they would do that. And it's interesting that the observatories that we have now, in modern times, uh, look very similar. Of course, we have advanced telescopes um, that that can see them much better. They probably made them in circular fashion so that you can turn easily, get up there and see from different um, windows and that sort of thing. Okay, here's another image of the ball field or one of the ball fields. There are quite a few. And then here's another one. And you can see the ring up there on the right that you would have to get through. And then also, um, you know, the slope right there. Um, we went one time and there was kind of a recreation. It was a dance more, but people did. They performed um, that game, that sport, and it, it was very entertaining. Okay, and here, this is a picture I took of Chichen Itza, or of the, the largest pyramid at Chichen Itza. And there's me, very happy. This would have been back in about... 2007, um, I think, in the pyramids behind us. Very hot that day. It was probably about 104 degrees. Um, after this, on our way back, we um, stopped at a cenote uh, and took a swim, and it was very cool and very refreshing. Okay, so this is the pyramid. I want you to look to the bottom left over here. Um, there is a snake's head, and um, this is this is very important. They built it very specifically so when you get i think it's a spring oh, let's see when you get a spring equinox um it appears that the snake is kind of wiggling its way into the ground with the shadows um so it, they, they've done time-lapse photography uh where it shows and it looks really super cool All right but there's the snake's head and then here's a diagram, which kind of shows how it's supposed to work. 
um, you know, there are other places where you could get a better understanding of it. Um, some of these words down here, Kukukan, um, Kechekaloko, whatever, these are ancient Mayan words that they still use. Um, one of my pl favorite places to go there is Akumel. Um, and Akumel in Mayan means turtle. Uh, and if you go there, it's, it's a beautiful place. It's become very touristy in the past 10 years or so. Um, but there's, you swim with the turtles, great big turtles through there. Okay, again, I put this on here so you see just how vast it is. And you can see, look at all the stonework and the detail. Some of these places have been rebuilt, but for the most part, um, a lot remain standing as they were. There's another um, hole you have to get a ball through, straight up. And then this right here, this is an original carving on there. It's very difficult to see, but it shows um, a human sacrifice taking place and they're holding the head, a severed head up. Um, so this is something that they would have done, um, cut off heads or um, pulled out parts. Here's another place too where human sacrifices would have taken place. Seems eerie to think of that as you walk by it and you wonder how many people lost their lives there. Um, here is an image um, that was drawn by um, some Mayan people and it shows ripping out the beating heart at that time. All right, so let's move on now to the Aztecs. The Aztecs were a powerful militant uh, group of people that um, were located in central Mexico on the site of what is today Mexico City. And they had emerged in the 14th, 15th, 16th century. And they had a feudal system. Now, for those of you who don't know what a feudal system is, this is something that they had in Europe at that time, too. They also had feudal systems in Asia and in Africa. Um, it, it seems like it's universal throughout the world is what people did. So a feudal system is where you have a king or a queen. Um, and these people become very, very powerful uh, because they have um, force right? Somehow, whatever weaponry. Now, keep in mind that all of the people of the Americas were basically living in the Stone Age at the time that the Europeans came over, and the Europeans had weapons. You know, they had gunpowder and all sorts of different things. So uh, the Europeans were at a great advantage over uh, the Native Americans uh, when they came over. Um, but anyway, these Aztec were very, very powerful um, and very militant, and they had conquered all the surrounding people, um, and they made them part of their feudal state. So they, the Montezuma was the king, and then he would have people loyal to him that controlled other areas, um, and then those people had to pay tribute. So they were tributary states, right, um, that, um, you know, pledge their fealty, um, their loyalty in exchange for protection or so that they wouldn't be beaten, right, or defeated and enslaved or killed or, or whatever. Oftentimes human sacrifices were those people that were captured in war. Um, but anyway, they built their capital at Tenochtitlan, which is the present day site of um, Mexico City. Now the God of War, Sun, and Human Sacrifice directed that the people settle there on this island, right? So the gods said to do this. And they said, people find an island on a lake or in a lake, and then on this island, you will find a cactus. And on the cactus, there will be an eagle and in the eagle's mouth will be a snake. So that's where you have to put the capital and that's what they did. It's believed that they had about 20 million people um, there at that time. So just a vast civilization in central Me Mexico. Um, what's interesting is Mexico City is one of the largest cities in the world today. So anyway, they too did not have the wheel. They traded with people in uh, North America and in South and Central America. And they were conquered by Hernan Cortez. All right, so this is where they were located there uh, between the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean. And Tenochtitlan is um, its capital, and that is where Mexico City is located today. It's the core state. And then you look at these tributary states that go out there. Those are the ones that were defeated um, by the Aztecs. So they didn't really like them very much. So Cortez, when he comes, um, he's going to come in over here at Veracruz. Now, Veracruz is located along 
um, the Gulf of Mexico about right there. Cortez is going to march this way, and as he goes, he's going to get other people uh, who want to help in conquering the Aztecs. Um, he didn't really need them because after he surrounded Tenochtitlan for a couple of years, the people died out due to um, the disease that the Europeans brought. But anyway, you can see the tributary states, and then you see the allied state. Um, they were allied with them. They had peace treaties of sorts, uh, but this is Teotitlan. Um, located to the southeast of Tenochtitlan. Okay, so this is a lake that they put Tenochtitlan on. It's Lake Texcoco, um, which does not exist any longer. It's been filled in since, um, well, since Mexico City was created in New Spain. So there's maybe some marshy land here and there, um, but for the most part, um, it's, it's gone. Also, Mexico City is surrounded by mountains on all sides. And for this reason, it's very polluted because if you imagine one of the largest cities in the world uh, with everything that that involves, you know, industry and exhaust and humans and everything, um, there's no place for a lot of that pollutants to go because it's in a valley and it's difficult to it, for it to get blown away. So the air quality in Mexico City is very poor. Um, if you look up here um, to the right, there's a place called Tia, Tia Tehuacan. I'm trying to circle it, but I'm not very good at it. Uh, Tia Tehuacan right here. Um, so you're going to see it. I point that out because you're going to see an image of it with some ruins um, that are still around today. Okay, so this is how the legend has it. There was going to be a lake. You can see the lake in the blue there, the little part of the picture. Uh, on the lake would be an island, which is the gold part. And on the island would be a cactus. I don't have to explain that. And on the cactus, it's going to be an eagle. And in the eagle's mouth is going to be a snake, right? So that is a symbol uh, that is near and dear to the hearts of the people of Mexico. And you can see the colors of uh, the Mexican flag down below that. So it's kind of like their great seal and is located on the center of their national flag. Okay, so this is Tenochtitlan and what it looked like, a uh, depiction of it. You know, you got that island out there, the mountains around it, the causeways that go to it. So Cortez comes and he surrounds it and it took him a couple of years and he conquered them. Here's another image of it. Um, this is a Spanish drawing. You can see the, the writing over there in Spanish, the cathedral and all these different things that they were gonna have. Uh, going on that they they changed it. They basically raised most of um, what the Aztec had there. There are some places though that still exist. Okay, so here is an image of one of the pyramids that's located there. So this pyramid would have been a site for religious um, rituals that take place, and as I said, that involved human sacrifices. There would be so much so that there would be blood flowing down these stairs. Right now. The Spanish kind of, a lot of historians just kind of discount what the Spanish reported because the Spanish said that what they would do is they would take the skulls of these dead people and put them together and build columns around them and everybody's like, yeah, that didn't really happen. Uh, but excavation has shown, archaeological excavation has shown that, that was in fact true. And they have codices, um, writings that were done um, by the Spanish people who are writing things down and then drawings that were done by the Aztec people themselves that depict these events. So here is from one of those codices. Here's human sacrifices taking place, blood just going down. It's also believed that they did practice some sort of cannibalism too, but it was more for a spiritual purpose uh, than the fact of eating people to get nutrients or that sort of thing. Okay, so here is also an Aztec depiction of what I said, putting the heads together. They would bore these holes through the skulls right here and then put rods through them a few at a time and then join them together and then wrap them around and make these huge columns um, that would go up that would be made out of human skulls. That would be, you know, you'd have mortar uh, keeping them together. Right, so here, uh, this kind of talks about the codices. Uh, the drawings would be done by the indigenous population, but the Spanish would write these things down. Um, so they, it was used to show native art uh, and record a lot of the events that took place, including the conquest of Montezuma. Sometimes though, the, the events differ. 
because the perceptions of the Aztec people were quite different than that of um, the Spanish people, right? The Aztecs were like, they just came and killed us for no reason. And the um, Spanish were like, well, we attacked them because they were attacking us and, and that sort of thing. So it's really a clash of cultures because they see things very differently. Um, Europeans too have this tendency uh, and some would say that they still do to see things from a Eurocentric perspective that the Europeans matter and the indigenous population did not. They almost treated them as if they were like animals, they were barbarians, they, they were heathens, they didn't have religion, they didn't believe in God, and so they could be treated anyway, right? Um, but what historians are now looking at is that these people had agency. Um, they too were established civilizations, they had rituals, they had belief systems, which uh, Europeans didn't attribute to them, didn't give them credit for. Ooh, here are some of those skulls, columns that were built up that had been excavated through archaeological digs. And then here are some of them being studied. Right, this is Cornet, or Hernan Cortez. Uh, he is the one who came with 600 people and he conquered the Aztecs. He comes in at Veracruz and marches over with horses and livestock and armor and guns and weapons and all of these things that just overwhelm the Aztec people. They were like, what is this? You know, the ships, everything was, it was quite different, right? There are some accounts that the Aztecs thought that he was a god returning to them, right? And at first they were, they were very humble towards them. Um, but when they found that they couldn't communicate, they couldn't um, negotiate, then they turned to warfare. Uh, and this is what we see again and again that was happening between indigenous populations and uh, Europeans, right? So it did take two years to conquer and he did it not through really much that much warfare, uh, just by sitting back and, and watching as so many of these indigenous populations died um, from smallpox and other diseases, right? But basically destroyed um, the empire, conquered the rest of Mexico, uh, declared it in the name of the king and queen of Spain, made himself a conquistador. He became very, very wealthy from all the gold that they found there, right? And he created new Spain. So this is going to be a, ter a vast territory. This it's going to include um, Mexico, California, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, parts of Texas, Colorado, um, going up into the United States. All right. So here this shows the tract. Um, the red does where uh, Hernan Cortez comes in uh, from the Gulf and then proceeds over to Tenochtitlan. All right, and here is a, an image depicting Montezuma, who was the king of the Aztecs, greeting and meeting uh, Cortez. Look at the differences right, um, in these two different cultures as they clash and come together. All right, so that, that is probably more a European depiction. Um, this is a Aztec depiction. Now, if you see the person seated in the chair on the left, that's supposed to be Cortez. Right, he has on the armor and everything else. I'm not sure, those are maybe feathers on his helmet. Behind him is a woman um, known as Maliche, uh, or Malicha. She was a Mayan woman from the Yucatan um, and she spoke some languages and she came and she was used as a translator um, for Cortez. Um, so this was in 1519. Uh, Columbus had been in the area, you know, 1492. So the Spanish had been there for a while. Probably she had learned some Spanish um, in that time period and was able to communicate uh, with the indigenous population and, and, and interpret for the Spanish. All right, so here, if you look at the top picture, you can kind of see different worlds coming together. Um, in the foreground, at the very beginning, you can see some Aztec ruins, what would have been uh, part of the city prior to uh, the Spanish coming, and then in the background, this huge cathedral um, that the Spanish brought over, or that the Spanish built, because one of their reasons uh, for coming was to glorify God. They wanted to spread Christianity. 
And then there's the modern Mexico, modern buildings that are right there. Um, this right here, I told you to Tia Tehuacan. I wanted you to know this. This is like northwest part of um, Mexico City. Uh, this is where a huge pyramid exists today. I, was, I read a little blog on a student thing for a different high school in a different part of the country where they went there on a trip and it took like 10 minutes for them to walk up to the top of it. And this one you're allowed to walk on. All right, so now the Inca, and we're going to kind of go through this quickly so that we can get on with the people of North America. Um, so anyway, they developed around 1200, and they developed this vast, intricate, highly structured society. They, too, had a feudal system. They had a king who ruled over everything there, and you'd have administrators along the way. Um, and everybody in their society was required to do something uh, to be a part of the society. So if you're a young man, you're a warrior, right? Um, if you are a woman, you're going to go out and collect berries and that sort of thing. If you're blind, you might be collecting termites. Yes, I said termites because that's something that they ate, right? And you put them into these handmade jars that they made of clay or something like that. Most women were supposed to make cloth. They were excellent weavers, right? So you'd have these looms, these hand looms that they would do, and they would make intricate cloth that even the people of Peru are still known for today. When uh, Francisco Pizarro came over and conquered them in 1532, so this would have been about 12, 13 years after um, Hernan Cortez conquered um, the Aztecs. So anyway, they found warehouses and warehouses, whatever an Inca warehouse looked like, of all this cloth, which of course the Spanish didn't care about. And they would burn it, and they wanted the gold. And there was a lot of gold and silver to be had uh, in um in this, the Andes Mountains, right? There still is. Uh, but anyway, they expanded in 1442, uh, but then they were conquered um, by um, Cortez, or Pizarro, excuse me. Uh, notice too, they did not have the wheel. Um, they spoke the Quechua language. The descendants of these people in Peru and other locations still speak Quechua. And what they have done is they have sort of married together the Spanish culture with their um, Quechua heritage or Inca heritage um, and, and have different aspects of both societies um, in, in the present day uh, locations of what was once the Incan Empire. And this shows you where it is. So the center was lo located at Cusco, right? So that's in the purple there with the red dot. Um, it's not far from Lake Titicaca, um, which is that big lake up there in the Andes Mountains. Um, so, um, so that, that's where it was. And then it was administered from there on out, right? So it went all the way from Colombia down to Chile, uh, down there. And as I said, their capital was located at Cusco. Right. This is very interesting. This is Machu Picchu. It's on my bucket list. Right? I want to hike up the Andes Mountains to go there and then take the train back down. Um, but anyway, this kind of had been lost um, to civilization um, because once Pizarro came and they were not concerned with what was up in the mountains. Um, but an American explorer um, went there, he hiked up there, and this much of it was overgrown. But I want you to look down there. You could see um, the rooftops um, of these buildings. you see them? They're perfect. Um, there, there's no roof on them because it would have been thatch. But this is very similar to what um, the Europeans used to do. You could go to Ireland and you could see it today, or many parts of England, you know, where they had thatch roofs, right? So it was there. Um, the stonework is very, very detailed. So much so that some historians have opined that perhaps aliens had come and laser cut these stones to fit so perfectly and that's what I'm talking about. Look at this. Do you see those stones? How perfectly they just match together? And that's where they're like, it could only be done with lasers. Uh, but what they have done is that some craftsmen in Peru uh, were able to demonstrate how you would cut it with very rudimentary tools uh, to make those very tight cuts, right, so that they fit perfectly. Okay, and then here are some of the remnants and artifacts of the Inca on the far left. And, and when I've been in Mexico, I see something like this always hanging up on the wall. 
Um, but it's called a kipu. Um, and it just looks like macrame art, right? But it's not. What it is, it's um, like an accountant's uh, ledger book, right? Each of those little knots on there accounts for something. It might be, you know, a llama, an alpaca, a uh, guinea pigs, um, all the things that they would keep uh, records of. So the person who was the treasurer, uh, the person who kept the kipu was called the kipu kamayu, right? Uh, I don't know why I remember that. It's just one of the things from my anthropology classes in college that I did. Um, here too is an example of very intricate cloth. Can you imagine on a hand loom um, weaving this cloth? They're still known for it in Peru today and every young woman knows how to weave, right? And then down below is a piece of gold. Uh, amazingly, it hadn't been melted down by the Spanish and we do see a little bit of the Incan uh, architecture and what they, or not architecture, artwork uh, and what they had done uh, with gold. All right, now we're getting to civilizations in North America. So some of the key concepts that you have to understand here is um, how did different indigenous populations live and support themselves based upon their environment? And the United States is very vast and it's very different. We have places where there are very few natural resources right but there were people living there and they adapted to them and then you have places where it's very the forests are rich um with with animals for hunting and the oceans are rich with with um fish and everything else so what they did is they took advantage of their resources and what they had there um so you have to understand too what was going on at the time one thing that was developed was maize which is corn and agriculture had been discovered by humans it's believed maybe in asia about 10,000 years ago, uh, but they had it here. Now, it used to be that people would just be hunter-gatherers, but once people determined that they could put a seed in the ground and then have something grow, then what you have um, is you, you could have sort of these sedentary, not sedentary, but um, lifestyles where you're not nomadic. You have permanent settlements, or you could be semi-nomadic, right? But you, you settle down and you grow your crops and you have your food right there, right? Um, and if you do that, then only some people need to grow the food. You get a division of labor because other people can go get the water and other people can make soap and other people can make candles or whatever it is, tortillas um, that you need, right? So you have this division of labor. Um, so what this did, the maize supported, the growth of maize of corn supported the development of more permanent settlements. You get irrigation system. Up in Machu Picchu, they terraced the landscaping and they had irrigation going through. Um, in the, the Southwest, they would irrigate from rivers um, where they had uh, stone dwellings into the cornfields, right? Um, so anyway, they did all of this. And as I said, they developed different social stratifications and diversification of social groups, and then also uh, division of labor, uh, as I said before, right? So anyway, the way that they did this was a form of um, planting corn and beans and squash all at the same time. This was called the Three Sisters Farming, right? And so you're going to get uh, populated societies that centered around this agriculture. It was very, very important, right? Um, so even though they would get these larger settlements, they didn't get these advanced civilizations like in Central and South America, right? As a result, they were very easily subdued by the Europeans. Actually, most of the civilizations were, right? Um, you're going to see, too, that these people were very, very different from the Europeans. Um, the Europeans, with their belief in Christianity, differed a great deal um, from Native Americans. Native Americans had this belief that nature was very much entwined with their religion. It was part of it because animals and plants and humans were all connected um, by this superior life force. And this was known as animism. So this is going to create conflict as the two cultures come together um, and they don't see eye to eye because they're looking at the world so differently. Uh, very thinly populated here in North America. Uh, it's believed that they only had like two to three million people. Uh, of that 54 million people in the Americas, only two to four million were here in what is now the United States. Ironic, since now the United States is like the third largest country in the world. Okay, and here are some of the different um, locations. Um, and in different locations, they lived very similarly. 
right? Um, so if, if you look here at the plains, um, there's very few resources there. There's very few resources here. So what these people, these people were very nomadic, right? They moved around a lot. Um, on the plains, they had teepees and the teepees were like tents that you could pack up and take with you and then you set them back up again, right? Um, and then um, the people in the American Southwest, the, the terrain is very harsh, so they would move around a lot too. In the summers, they might go to be like cliff dwellers, but in the winter, they might move to other locations, right? Um, up here where we are um, in Illinois and then up and through here, more settlements existed, right? You had more natural resources and, and the, the soil was better to plant crops. Um, the, the weather was better, um, right? So you get a lot of settlements there. Here in, um, in the Southeast, this is where we're gonna get a group of people known as the five civilized tribes. Um, they of course use the ocean to their advantage. Um, you know, you have seafood and that sort of thing, but also you could grow crops there too. You could grow corn. So there would be some settlements there as well. Now over here in California um, and the Pacific Northwest, lots of uh, resources in this area. So the forest um, were plentiful of uh, game. Uh, you had a lot of um, you know, fresh water and then also you know, very rich bounty in the oceans as well. So keep that in mind as we go through that these different groups um, develop differently based upon their environments. All right, here's another look at that, different tribes in different locations. We'll talk more about that in class. Right, and then this is the three sisters uh, form of um, farming, if you look at it right here. So you grow the corn up and the corn exhausts the soil of certain nutrients, but then you plant beans, which are legumes. Here we rotate the crops, right? Sometimes you plant corn and then other years you plant beans. Well, they're planting it all at the same time. So the corn is taking certain things away and the beans are putting things back in brilliant and then you're going to grow the squash around it that's going to help to keep the soil moist right from not baking from the hot sun you're going to have the leaves there and then also it's going to prevent the weeds from coming up and you get all of these nutrients that are going to take place right you're going to get your your corn your squash your beans all the things that you need for sustenance um, so it was just very very um, intelligent here they were having a population boom at the time that the europeans came but of course the europeans are going to come it's going to be devastating um, and then um, they're going to the europeans are going to take all these new finds of of crops back to Europe and they're going to start planting them there. It's going to create a population boom there and a lot of those people are going to come here and they're going to bring more diseases. So it's going to be very good for the Europeans but very bad for the indigenous populations. Okay, so let's look at these groups here. The Anasazi, um, these people are known as the Pueblo. Uh, by the Spanish, um, Pueblo means village. So they had villages, um, they adobe huts, um, they would have cliff dwellings, those sorts of things. Um, so they, they did have agriculture, they grew corn and other crops, um, corn tortillas, right? They made those, um, but, and what they would do is they'd have um, irrigation systems uh, that would be created so that they could grow those crops. Because as you know, in the Great Basin here is very dry. Uh, in this part of the United States, right? Um, so they're very known too for their pottery that they did. They made it out of the clay there in their homes too. They were regarded highly by the Spanish, right? Um, they built all these adobe homes on the cliffs. The largest of those was Chaco Canyon. This is gonna be something you're gonna have a video. You're gonna watch about that and it'll show you a little bit about it. Um, that was located there in New Mexico. Um, you can kind of see it in the Northeast corner or northwest corner uh, where it says Anasazi there it says Canyon Chaco or Chaco Canyon north of there there's also Mesa Verde that's going to be located up there in um, Colorado just across the border and then you can see too the Colorado River um, going down into Arizona there um, just to the east of Las Vegas that is where uh, we have the Grand Canyon Okay, so this is an image of Chaco Canyon, right? It's uh, it was a lot of um, 
made about 850 to 1200 years ago, about a thousand years ago, right? So it was a, a center for administration, ceremonies, religious ceremonies, and those sorts of things. Hundreds of buildings um, existed on this location. And then what they had some very intricate road systems that connected it to other cities and um, in the, the area, uh, and they were all related with the same culture, the Anasazi or the Pueblo culture of Chaco people. Right here, this is Mesa Verde. Uh, this is in Colorado, southern Colorado, very famous uh, location as well, not as large as Chaco Canyon. And then this one on the left, Montezuma's Castle, it's in Arizona, I've been to it. We went one time um, to the Grand Canyon and then we went to Flagstaff and then we're driving down to Sonoma. And as you go down toward south uh, in Arizona, the scenery changes completely. You go to this pine forest and then you start getting these big cacti. I mean, it just changes um, drastically. And as we're there, this is right off the interstate, uh, Montezuma's Castle. Um, that is located right there. And then here's another one uh, along the cliffs. So these were really smart. They adapted to it to keep you um, safe from the elements, right? Uh, the heat, it would be cooler over there. Usually when you go down there, you can see there's some greenery. Here, there were the forests were there. And there's also, it's near a water source. Um, and so you could divert the, the water and you could have irrigation so you could grow crops. Um, so it was ingenious. All right, and then in Illinois, down there near East St. Louis, we had one of the largest civilizations that existed in what is now the United States before Christopher Columbus, and that is Cahokia. So it's believed that this was in existence between about the same time as the Vikings came over here from 900 to 1100. Um, AD or the common era, about 20 to 50,000 people. Vast civilization, it was centrally located and they traded with people in all different locations, all the way down into Mexico and Central America, probably South America uh, and North and East. So they traded. We know that because there would be like turquoise or other things in the location. Um, the problem with it though is it died out because they ran out of fuel. So Illinois is kind of on that area there where you, you had woodlands as the native vegetation and then it becomes grassland, right? And you can't burn grass very well. Um, you know, they needed wood and they were losing that. So they ran out. So here are some images. The one on top left is what you would see if you visited it today. Ironically, as many times as I've driven by it on the way to my in-laws house, I have never been. My family has. Um, that's on my bucket list for this summer though. Um, so here's a depiction of what it would have looked like with the drawings on the bottom and then on the right. Notice how they too built sort of pyramids, but in Illinois we don't have rock and stone. Uh, so what they used instead um, was dirt. We have a lot of dirt. Um, in the background there um, is a depiction that shows the rivers, and that would have been like the um, Illinois River flowing into the Mississippi, and then you have the Missouri River as well that goes up from there. Not the Illinois River, excuse me. I meant the Cahokia, um, not the Cahokia, Kaskaskia River, excuse me. All right, and then here too, um, some remnants. What they had is something like a, a a circle of a post there and what they believe that um, it could kind of help to tell time in terms of the equinox and solstice and so uh, they would have that so it was a ritual circle cycle as well um, they kept track of time that way all right, another group of people, these were like the Eastern Woodlands. It was a confederation. There were, this was about the time that the Europeans came over. Um, so what they did is all these Indians came together uh, to form an alliance as a for a military and political necessity, right? Uh, Hiawatha uh, did it in the 16th century. And one thing about them is they did their family lineage through the mother, right? So it was a matrilineal um, culture, right? So it passed on from the woman's family, not from the man's. Um, during these, this is a very important group that you need to be aware of because they allied with the British during the French and Indian War, but they also allied with the British during the American Revolution uh, and they lost, right? So when, after the revolution, um, they lost a lot of territory. After the, the French and Indian War, the British protected their land. Um, so they were under their protection, and that is why they joined forces with them 
um, to fight against the Americans and the American Revolution. Okay, so here is a map. Uh, this is about 1650. Keep in mind that the British established themselves at Jamestown in Virginia in 1607, and then they established themselves um, up in what is today Boston in 1620 with droves of people coming in 1630. And so they are feeling the pressure. And so here you have the Mohawk, the Onondaga, uh, the Cayuga, uh, the Seneca, these different groups of people coming together to form that confederation known as the Iroquois. This was going to change, if you look at the next slide, in 1720, you're going to get the Tuscarora. They came up from, um, I think the Carolinas, kind of moving for safety uh, there in 1720. Okay, they lived in longhouses. So uh, these people had permanent, mostly permanent settlements, uh, not like the people out on the Great Plains or the people who were um, in, in other locations. Even the, the Anasazi moved around because of the, the terrain and the climate. These were more permanent. As a matter of fact, one thing that they did is oftentimes they would do mass burning of the forest um, so that that would release a lot of the nutrients in the dirt and um, so that they could grow crops better. Um, they didn't have fences. They didn't have these animals that grazed. Um, so they are going to have their crops there. And when Europeans come over, it's going to be a problem uh, because the Europeans are going to let their um, cows go into the forest and graze, and they're going to go and destroy uh, the Native Americans' gardens. That doesn't seem like a big deal, but it is because you're growing all that food to keep you through the winter, right? Um, and so Europeans also had this notion that you own the land. Uh, Indians didn't have that notion. Europeans are going to put up fences, right? So there's going to be a lot of conflict. All right, and then down here, these are the southeastern tribes. Those are the five civilized tribes, the Chickasaw, Choctaw, Seminole, Crete, um, Cherokee, uh, that are down there, right? <clears throat> so uh, they're known as the civilized tribes because later what they're going to develop is their own constitution, their own alphabet. Um, some of the Cherokee were even plantation owners and had slaves, right? So uh, very different um, from those that were out on the Great Plains. All right, so characteristics and differences between, and this is our last slide, um, between Europeans and um, and the Native Americans is going to be vast, right? Uh, very different. Um, so they didn't have the wheel because they didn't have these pack animals, right? Um, they didn't have large urban centers. Uh, oftentimes, uh, it counted on natural resources, so there's a depreciation of that. Cahokia is an example of it. They didn't have written records. Um, it's just people who would pass things down one generation verbally to another. They didn't have those immunities to diseases. Uh, one of the biggest things is that their religion was quite different. As I said before, they believed in animism, right? That the supernatural controlled everything and everything was interwoven together. Um, the spirit world, animals, humans, um, plants, everything. They also worked um, collectively. They weren't individualistic as Europeans are. Um, they worked as a group for the betterment of all of them. And there's this notion that you had reciprocity, right? That if you do something for me, I have to do something for you. Europeans are going to use that to their advantage. I'm going to give you these silver beads. What are you going to give me? Right? I want your horse, right? Or something like that. Um, so there was reciprocity. They also had a different view of how men and women gender roles were. Um, women did the farming and the men did the hunting and they were the warriors. And so Europeans are going to come and think that, oh, these men are so lazy. Why aren't they doing the farming? They're making their women do it. Um, but the men were the ones that went out and they hunted. And then they also, and while they weren't hunting, they were saving up the energy to go hunt. Um, so we're going to be talking about some of these other differences as we go through. Okay, sorry it was so long. Um, talk to you in part two.